to be a stagnant people. Can somebody say amen? Amen. amen. We're never called to just plateau. I was driving through Arizona and up through Nevada a few months back when we went over to see my grandchildren. And there were the plateaus. It was beautiful. But we're not called to plateau. We are called to continue growing. We are called, you know what our life is, is, is? It's like a ski lift. You start on the bottom and it keeps on going up. Can somebody say amen? Mm -hmm. And so as we look at this, I want to say this, that discipleship is God's best way of grooming and training his people. Discipleship is God's best way. It's his very best for his people. Now, if you're going to be discipled, you've got to have faith first. Somebody say that. Mm -hmm. Faith first. Faith first. And so, that the first test that Jesus puts us through to see, it really is to see if you have faith enough to believe. If you have faith enough, and now faith is an action word. Because you can talk a lot, there are a lot of people that talk about things but never actually do it. God's people not, should not only talk about it, but we should be applying it and putting it into action. We should be working it out in our lives. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, and I pinned it in here because the Lord kind of dropped this into my spirit last night. It wasn't originally in my message. It's Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. It says, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as them, but the word they heard did not profit them because it was not, listen, it did not profit them nothing because it was not mixed, mixed with faith to those who heard it. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that, that has a lot to say. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them. Not being mixed with the faith in those who heard it. In other words, you can be in the midst of revival. You can be in the midst of God doing something supernatural. And hear the very same words that are spoken but you have no faith to activate it in your life so it profits you nothing. But if you take what you hear and apply it to your life, it profits you everything. Can somebody say amen? amen. amen. And so as we get into this, you need to have faith. For faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And the Bible says, and by faith, the elders obtain a good report. Woo! That's a good thing to say amen to. Amen. So let's get into it. In the book of Luke, chapter 9, verse 23, the Bible speaks about taking up the cross and following him. Amen. Luke, chapter 9, verse 23, says, Then he said to them all, Say all. all. Say, That's me. Look at your neighbor and say, that's you. that's you. Amen. It means it's all. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his own life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. What does a man profit if he gains the whole world and he himself is destroyed or lost? I uh, see a lot of people, I'm not going to get into that, because I believe that God does want to bless us. But how many understand, it isn't just a blessing to, to uh, be a multi-millionaire, if somebody was that way. They can have all the goods of this world and still not be in the right spot when it comes to talking to, to you as a spiritual sense. Amen. Right. It, it, it can go, it can, you know, you can have everything in life. And still be miserable. That's right. You can have all the success in life and still not acquire what God wants you to have. You remember the rich from the ruler? He says, I've kept all the laws. I've done everything that you told me to do. And you know what the Lord told him? Okay, well, he says, what else do I have to do? He says, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come back and follow me. And because he was so bound up to the thing, now God's not against you having things, but because he was so bound up to the things that he had, he was unwilling to do that. The Bible says he walked away very sad in his countenance because he held on to the things of life. Let me tell you something. Holding on to the things of life does not bring spiritual maturity, but being a person that is willing to release them in 
into God's hands and trust God and continue going on and serve Him to the fullest is the only way that you're ever going to grow spiritually in your life. Amen. And so we're going to get into this in this, uh, I don't want to say series, but you can take it for a series if you want to. And the challenge really to every believer is to overcome what is holding you back. What is it that is holding you back to be totally sold out for God? What is it that's holding on to you that is stopping you from totally being sold out for God? Now, I'm going to hit on some areas today because the call of discipleship is to follow. There is no other way. It is straightforward. It is a straightforward call. There is a cost to discipleship. And if you're going to be a true follower and a disciple, you must break away from the familiar. You can't follow all the things that the world has. It is something, it's not a, a short-term call, but it is a call to be lived out in your life. Discipleship, listen, isn't a program or an event. We, we can have programs and event in church, and that does not disciple you. Discipleship is more than just giving your life to the Lord and coming to church on Sunday, go up to meetings on Sunday morning. Discipleship is every day of your life, like you were saying, Praying and getting a hold of God. If you're fasting and you want that to really benefit in your life, there needs to be prayer and the study of God's Word and applying it to your lives. And so, discipleship is not a program. Discipleship isn't just for new believers. It is for everybody in everyday life. It is what we do. It is what the church does. It is a lifetime of growing it is a lifetime of even having times when you've got to press through issues in life. It is facing life head on and believing God and being committed to a purpose so God can fulfill His destiny in your life. Can somebody say amen? amen? It is pressing through the hard times. It is having a dog uh, ten tenacity that says, I am not going to give up. I am committed to the course that God has laid out to my life. See, a disciple, listen to this, a disciple as disciples, say, I'm a disciple. I'm a disciple. A disciple must realize the importance of God's work and take it seriously. Most Christians stop right there. They get saved, and that's it. No growth. They get saved, and they think that's all they have to do. Well, a disciple understands that if you really want to be uh, come out and to be used of God, a disciple isn't just getting saved, but a disciple presses in and goes and gets involved and takes it seriously to get involved in the work of God. In other words, there can be things that are languishing, things that are not done, that are incomplete, and a disciple will look at that and say, there's more work to be done. Can somebody say amen? Amen. A disciple is committed to see everything that God wants to do in the local church and they're willing to get involved and step up and to do it. That's a disciple. Amen. A disciple says, I'm willing to pay the price. A, di a disciple says, I'm willing to lay it all down. A disciple says, you know what, okay, the football game is on Sunday and it's my favorite team. I'll just record it. I'm going to church. Can somebody say amen? And the disciple says, you know what, that's okay. I don't feel too good, but I'm going to church anyway because I'm going to let that preacher lay his own greasy hands on my head and pray for me because I believe in God that's going to heal me and my kids. Amen. And the disciple lays down it all, and he doesn't take a hold of the things of the world and allow it to influence the life. And the disciple says, I am committed to this 110%. Amen. Now, said, maybe he ought not go on vacations too much. <laughs> on a vacation, amen. You see, when we see things that are incomplete, a disciple says, what can I do to help? A disciple is willing to be used. In Matthew 9, verse 35, the Bible says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every 
every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the, and I like this part, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary. Anybody ever been weary? Mm -hmm. And they were scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, to his disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful or plenteous, but the laborers, people that are applying their lives and going up and being used of God are very few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send out laborers into the harvest field. Now, when you look at this, what it's talking about is that there's a great need in the church. There's a great need in the church. And that is that people would step up and be used of God. Can somebody say amen? Mm -hmm. Say amen or oh me. Amen. You, you come here today with your hard hats on, your steel toe shoes, I hope. Amen. <laughs> How many know my job isn't to come here and give you candy coated Christianity? Come on. My job is to, for you to come in here with your hard hat on, your, your steel toe shoes. And, and you know what? I've got slapped around by so many people that preach, but I'll tell you what, it did me good. We're going to see in the Word of God how it really begins to detour us and challenge us to step out by faith and believe God for the impossible. And that's where it's fun to live. That's where it's fun. That's where you really grow. See, discipleship means that you're following a teacher. And you notice here that Jesus had compassion on the crowd. He saw they were weary, and they were scattered like sheep with no shepherd. What Jesus is saying is that they needed guidance. They needed, they saw a place to grow, to be stable. They needed a place where a shepherd really is something, is one that is there to protect, lead, and guide. A shepherd is willing, listen to this, a shepherd, and, and, and how many understand a shepherd, listen to this, a shepherd needs sheep dogs. Say amen or oh me. A shepherd can't run around the sheep and, 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 and take care of all the sheep all the time. He, he, how many know it's good to have some sheep dogs? Now, you know what a sheep dog is? A sheep dog, they're running around. You ever seen those collies, border collies, how they run around the sheep and they keep them herded? That's what our jobs are. Some people have gifts and they can have talents and abilities and, and, and you all do. And so these sheep dogs, they're, they're, they're helping out the shepherd. And so when that old big bad wolf comes, that old bad boy's that sheep dog just, boom, it hits that dog dog wolf. And it starts biting that wolf off. And see, that's what sheep dogs are. Sheep dogs are all, they know the shepherd can't be everywhere all the time. So you got people that understand that there's things that are languishing. There's things that need to be done. And so they become a sheep dog. Can somebody say Amen. And they protect the flock. They look out for the church. They protect you. And so, and you know something about being a sheepdog or being a disciple? Is that you've got to allow your life to be interfered, some, interfered sometimes. That means people are sticking their nose up in your business. But the reason why you're doing that, you're allowing that because you understand that a part of discipleship is, is that I'm going to allow them to get to know me so they can speak and begin to help me grow spiritually in my life. In other words, a disciple... It's an open book, and, and it's not hiding everything. I, 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 you know, heard, you've heard me tell the story. I remember somebody come to your house, and your house is dirty. You're like, oh, shoot, they're at the door. <laughs> Hold on just a minute. You're throwing things, you know, this shouldn't have to be that way. Amen. Throwing your dope in there, you know, throwing your beer out and, and getting rid of all the, you know. And then, you know like, I remember, uh, what was the teaching child? Knock, knock, knock. Who is it? It's Dave. Dave's not here. You know, he's throwing shoving stuff down the toilet and hiding things. Amen. See, a disciple begins to feel the conviction in his life. They begin to get allow God to clean them up from the inside out. From the inside out. They're an expression of God doing a great work in their life. And a disciple will protect and lead and guide and and they're been, listen to this, they're willing to go to an extreme condition. They're willing to sell out. They're willing to lay it all down and protect and lead the sheep. See, Jesus calls us, the church, as believers, to do that as well. To reach out to the lost, to sow into their lives, to be willing to go further, to go the extra mile, to go, what I said, is to the extreme condition in their lives. See, discipleship making was the ministry of Jesus. For three and a half years, he taught the disciples. He brought them with him. He was developing and teaching and modeling and releasing. 
And here's the three things to a call. You have the calling, the preparing, and the sending. And here's what happens in a disciple's life. There are three things to that. There are three things that happen to a disciple's life. Is that they're reachable and teachable. What was the other one? Available, <coughs> reachable, and teachable. If you're not available to be used of God, and you know what really bothers me? I'll tell you a test to a disciple. Hey, can you help me do this today? next week when I feel better. I'm not prayed up. But, uh, <coughs> they're available. Another thing about a disciple is they're reachable. They're not hiding out behind the, the behind a tree somewhere when you're looking for them. Adam, where are you? So they're available. They're reachable. And if you want to be a disciple, You've got to be teachable. Somebody say teachable. teachable. You've got to allow somebody to be able to speak into your life and not just take what they hear and let it go through one ear and out the other, but a disciple will apply what they've been taught to their life and everyday living. Can somebody say amen? And so there's teaching to be modeled. And, and, if, and, and a disciple is committed to the task and the training and being spiritually fit so they can move on ahead. In the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 18, the Bible says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All, say all, all, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them, teaching them to observe all things, that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Amen. <laughs> so the key here is to all the church is that the church is called not only to be a disciple, but to be disciplers. Can somebody say amen? amen? In other words, take somebody underneath your wing and begin to teach them the things that you learn. When you have a baby, you give them milk. I was uh, giving my grandson milk the other day. <laughs> amen. And I burped him. He burped real quick. Thank God. And, and, and he, but you know what? As he grows, he's going to eat food. And you begin to teach him how to walk. And you mean, that's what a disciple is. When you first come to the Lord, you can't walk. But if you've been saved any amount of time, you shouldn't be on the bottle any longer. Come on. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 2, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. That's not in my notes, but it's talking about that you will grow, that you're not always on a bottle. But the Bible says you ought to buy now be eating meat, but you're still sucking on the bottle. That means you need to grow, you need to mature, you need to get out of that mindset that you're in and allow God to challenge you, to stretch you and grow you so you can be a mature Christian and be used of God to be a disciple or take somebody under your wing, begin to teach them. See, a disciple understands that what happens is that many people don't like these words. Let me put them bluntly to you. They don't like influence from other people. They don't like vision. They, you know, or they don't have any vision. I hope you have vision. You need to have vision. And you know, my job is to impart unto you the teaching, but it's your job to catch the gifts and the talents that God has given you and put the vision that God has put in your life to use. Amen. I can't make you do it. You've got to go by the leading of the Holy Spirit. A disciple is under submission. They're under accountability. They're vulnerable. In other words, there's vulnerability in their life. They're vulnerable. They allow them, like a sheep, we're dumb. Did you know they say a sheep, you can put it in two feet of water, and their coat gets so weighed down they drown? Sheep are dumb. They need guidance. How many know we're dumb? How many are dumb? I'm dumb. I'm dumb. You know why I'm dumb? Because I, I don't want to dumb you down. But I want to know, understand that you know, when it comes to the things of God, there's always more to learn. When you think you've learned it all, you're in trouble. Amen. And so a disciple is always, a disciple is always there. They're always vulnerable. And they're the type of people that are willing to confess or make confession that they need to change. A disciple studies. They get in the Word of God. They sacrifice. They understand discipline. 
And so it's more than just, I said, a Sunday go to meeting type of person when we come on Sunday, dust out the Bible when we're going to church. <laughs> but they're the type of people that are committed to every day to grow and be stretched in the things of God. Paul said it this way, and it's a challenge to every one of us, and that's to be different. Many people don't want to be different. They want just to fit in. They want to be accepted. They want to be loved by everyone. But listen, a disciple isn't called to just fit in. Say amen or oh me. And, and so a disciple operates under a life of training and growing to be different. If you're all, if you're just like the world, then you need to take a look at yourself. <clears throat> if you're doing everything that everybody does in the world, then you need to challenge yourself to be different than the world. Because a disciple needs to have a, 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 a real difference about their life. There needs to be something different about you. In 1 uh, Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, the Bible says, But reject profane and old wife take fables, and exercise yourself to godliness. Now, godliness is talking about a life of purity, a life of growth. It's, it's not talking about religion. How many know religion doesn't do a nothing for you? What are you? I'm Catholic, brother. What are you? I'm Protestant. What are you? I'm Pentecostal. Who cares? Are you living for God? That's the problem. You can have religion all day long and still split hell wide open. You've got to have a personal relationship with God. And to be a disciple, you've got to allow God to begin to change your life. Begin to change your emotions. You've got to become vulnerable. You've got to become realistic about your life and say, like Paul said, I examined myself to see that I'm in the faith. And, and, and you heard me earlier in Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2. Some heard the same word, but they didn't put it in. And it wasn't mixed with faith. They didn't use it, so it profited them absolutely nothing because they did not apply it to their life. So a disciple is always applying what they learned to their life and living it out through their lives. And there's an action that takes place. They, they don't just hear what they... How many, know, you, how many ever heard of an educated fool? <laughs> They've heard it. You know, you know the hardest people to teach many times? I gotta be honest with you, are those that think they've heard it all. You know, you know what? And I gotta admit there's been times somebody's teaching something, I'm like, man, I've heard this a hundred times. But how many understand that sometimes you need to hear it one more time? Come on. Yep. They asked Smith Wigglesworth, anybody ever heard of him? Why he kept preaching on faith. And he had a lot of things in history. If you read history books about his life, there were actual people that he prayed for that had died physical deaths. And he prayed for them and they were raised to life. And he was a man of God that was just, God used him, and he was a plumber. And he began to apply his life in such a way to God that he began to get a hold of God so much he began to pray. And as he went to preach in people's houses, he wouldn't gather at the dinner table with the latest gossip. He'd say, excuse me, I need to go to the room. And he'd get a hold of God and get his nose down in the book. And he got holy before God and he was dedicated to God and God began to use him. And medically speaking, many were raised from the dead because Smith Wigglesworth said, you know what? I am going all the way. I'm a disciple of God. And I want to be used of God. I'm selling out for God. And he left an imprint on the lives of people. Why? Because he was a committed disciple of God. And so, to be used of God, we must be committed. So somebody asked him, and I always call him Smitty. Hey, Smitty. Probably didn't call him that, but I do. Or just say, Smith, why are you still preaching on faith? He preached on faith. He was doing a revival. And he said, you know what? I'll keep on preaching on faith until somebody in this place gets sick. <laughs> Say amen or only. Amen. I'm going to continue doing it. So speaking here, to be honest with you, most people, when it comes to a disciple, do not like discipline. I don't know about you, but I don't like discipline. We avoid it like the plague. Like I know I need exercise, and I don't do it. Like I should. So we avoid it. And you know why we avoid discipline? Because it, dis it, it disrupts our normal, comfortable patterns of life. That's right. Nobody likes to be, you know what, I, my, my, there's certain things that I just, you know, this is what I do. Don't, don't tamper with that. That's what I do. It's my life. Everybody ever say that? If you're a disciple, guess what? It ain't your life. You gave up your life. When you're a disciple, you give everything up. You give up the rights.
so God can begin to work in your life. If you want real, true discipleship, you've got to let everything go. The Bible says, lay down your life. For he that lays down his life, gives it all, shall lose it. But he that holds on to it, I mean, he shall gain it. But he who holds on to his life is going to lose his life. So you've got, you know, if you want more as a disciple, it means you give more. You apply more. Let me get on it. We'll keep you all day. Amen. Might have to do a two part on this message right here. C.S. Lewis said these words. And he said, I detest these words. It is the word interference. To be interfered with. It means that, you know what interference means? It means that you allow somebody, someone, to stick their nose up in your business. I mean, no, I don't like that either. But what it's talking about here is it's talking about, however, that. That is a mark of a disciple is this. If you want to grow in a meaningful way, you don't only tolerate another person's knowledge of you, but you must also be willing to invite that person into your life so he can begin to disciple your life. That's what discipleship is. And what's even more about that is I learned something about discipleship is at first it feels like an interference. Listen to this. This is the cool part about discipleship. But if you're willing to open up and allow them to begin to speak in your life and to disciple you, and here's the cool part about it. It begins to grow on you. You begin to de depend on that person and appreciate them because they've helped you grow. Say amen or oh me. So it, it may be an interference, but it is a positive interference. Can somebody say amen? It may interfere in your life and get up in your business, but it's there for a reason. And there's a purpose for it. It's to groom you to be more like Jesus. It's to bring you along, amen, and, and, and to be all that you can be. Be all that you can be. Uh, how many have ever watched the movie the, A Man With No Face with Mel Gibson? I like that. He's a guy that, if you, if you look at the movie, and I'll stop here today. If you look at the movie, he had one side of his face that was burnt by a fire. It was terribly burnt one side of his body, and everybody thought he was a freak. And he lived in this house for years, but there was this little boy that felt like that, in, in his home he felt like he was the, the, the dummy of the household. And he was a little hard-nosed little kid, and, and so he found out that he was a teacher. And somehow he gets, his, his, new, his papers get all blown out, and they're all over the water, and he's studying, he wants to go to this military school, and everything that he studied got blown out. He, he had this dumb look on his face, like, looking over the water. His papers are floating all over the place. And Mel Gibson, the freak that everybody thought was a freak, a man sees him on his horse, and he has this big dog, and he goes down, and he brings a little boy up, gets him cleaned up, and he finds out that he's a teacher. And he had to stay quiet and tell anybody that he'd been at the freak's house. But the freak was a teacher. And everybody misinterpreted the freak. I think a lot of people look at preachers and teachers and men of God like, you know what, there's something freaky about them. But yeah, there is something freaky about them, is that they're different than the world. There's something freaky about them to the world, but when you allow them to begin to apply their knowledge and wisdom and understanding to your life, you're going to start depending on that and growing. And all of a sudden now, that interference is no longer a negative interference, but it's a positive interference. And if you watch the show, he begins to grow fond of this man. He loves him like he's his own father. And he begins to teach him because he's a teacher by trade. And he teaches them, and at the end of the movie, they make him stay away from the kid because they had thought that he had a relationship with a young man that never actually happened. The man was fond of him. He was his teacher is all he was. And so, so they, the, the, they go through court. They send him out. He leaves. But as he graduates from the military school, because he taught this young man how to grow and how to read and how to understand, that he's way out, and the Bible says he's a face that is always out in the crowd that you cannot see, and he's got these glasses on at the end of the movie, and he's looking over at the young man, and he says, I think that's, I can't remember his name, anybody remember his name in the book? In the movie? And he looks at him in the crowd, and he climbs up on something, he sees him, and he goes like this. And the teacher walks off. The whole moral of the whole story of that movie is, is that the young man was willing to be taught. But when he first started being taught, he hated. He, he, would, he would cheat. Anybody ever cheat on a test before? Shoot, I have. Let me tell you. I don't know the answer. I'm like, come on, somebody. You know? Hey, man, I... Is 
discipleship is learning through the school of hard knocks. It's making your life available. It's applying what's been taught to your life and making it realistic in real life. You get good grades in school, I saw. And you're good, you're a good student. And those are the type of people I like to put my brain to like this on. Mm -hmm. I want some of that. <laughs> you know, I want to learn, folks. And if you really want to grow in the things of God, you've got to be willing to step aside and allow interference in your life to be taught. I, I, I want to learn all I can learn. But I understand my son Gabriel's a smart man. And, you know, I, I, I look at myself sometimes and I have to study hard to get to where I am. We were here last night, we are working on the church clean, and doing those things, and, and, and how many understand that we could use a little help sometimes too, me and my wife, by the way. That shouldn't be just waiting on tables, I need to be in the book, amen? amen. I have a conviction on both sides, I want this house clean, this house clean, this is, uh, this is our house, can somebody say amen? amen? And when you take ownership of your house, that's a disciple, you take ownership, this is my church, amen? How fast are you over there cleaning it? I'm coming over and we'll give you, lend, lend you a helping hand. See, a disciple is willing to sell out. It's no longer his life. And I'll end, end with this. Only one life will soon be passed. And only what's done for Christ will last. So when I die, how glad I'll be <coughs> when they say these words, my life, or his life, has been lived out for thee. What side do you end on? Are you the one that threw in the towel, took the white flag, said, I ain't go no further than that? You the one like me, I mean, we all have probably, or looking over at the other guy's test. Are you the young man that doesn't want to be taught, hates reading? He told the man in the movie, I hate to read. He says, well, you know, we all, how many know we all might hate to read, but you learn something from it. A disciple is willing to lay it all down, to press through. Only one life, it will soon be passed, but only what's done for Christ will last. So when I die, how glad I'll be when they say that my life has been lived out for thee. I am living for the audience of one. I don't blend in with the world. I don't blend in. There needs to be something different about me that radiates out of my life, that there's a different aspect in this man's life. Let's pray. Praise God. Bow your heads. <coughs> Interference. The Bible said in Luke 19, 10, the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. Mark 10, 45, he says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served. This is Jesus Christ. He did not come here to be served by us, but to serve. Jesus came to serve us and give his life ransom for many. And you understand something about Jesus? That he, he, he paid the price completely. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Every head bowed and every eye closed just for a moment. My question is to you. Are you willing to lay it all down for Jesus? Are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to give up your rights? Are you willing to allow God to, be, to call you to a deeper commitment to things of God? And if you're not, ask yourself this question, why am I? Why aren't I willing to lay it all down? Is it maybe something you're still holding on to? The Bible says not to hold on to it, let it go. If you release it, there's a process of receiving even more. You hold on to it. The Bible says that, that you'll have it all taken. With every head bowed, every eye closed, just for a moment. Maybe you're here today. You'd say, you know what, Pastor Tom? I'm not serving God. The Lord, I'm not serving Him like I should. I'm not committed like I should be. I know there's more to this than, than what I've applied to my life. And I want to be realistic about my life. I want to rededicate my life to the things of God. And I want to give my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and, and, and be a realist today. Raise your hand if you pray for me. 
Would you pray for me? I want to commit my life to the Lord. I see those hands. Put them down. Anybody else, you'd be willing to lay it all down for Jesus. Lay it all down. Don't be ashamed. You know what the Bible says? If you're ashamed of me before man, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father in heaven. There ain't nothing to be ashamed of. Amen. Those two that raise their hand, look up here at me. I believe you meant that. Amen. Can you come up, please? Come up right now. We're going to pray with you. And the rest of you, would you pray with us as we lead them through a prayer? Amen. I believe God's beginning to send revival here in our church. I'm praying for that. Amen. We're going to rededicate. Amen. It's awesome. Awesome. I love you guys. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Repeat after me. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Be my Savior and my Lord. Come into my life. Help me to live for you every day. To lay down my life for you.